What's good, everybody? Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of Over Quota. Please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review if you haven't already. Now, of course, my goal for these interviews is to give listeners a variety of perspectives and insights from sales leaders who have a proven track record of exceeding expectations for themselves and or their teams, realizing, of course, that not one person has all of the answers. And like always, my company, the J. David Group, will be sponsoring this podcast until I get other sponsors. Uh, my company helps high growth software companies recruit top software salespeople and sales leaders. So go to the jdavidgroup.com forward slash hiring to learn more about that. Or you can go to the jdavidgroup.com forward slash looking if you're looking for your next big challenge. Now, my guest today is John Debajian. John is a senior sales leader that I've known for over 10 years, uh, maybe even closer to 15 at this point, um, who no matter where he's worked, has always left the sales organizations and the companies he's been a part of in much better shape than where he found them, uh, which is why I'm so excited to have him on today. John, welcome to Over Quota. Hey, Jake, thanks for having me. You know, it's uh, with the environment today, with this coronavirus, it's great giving us an opportunity to reconnect. I, I think it has been about 12 years, 12, 13 years. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. And, and I met you when I was trying to recruit you from a company by the name of Softrax and put you into the company that you ultimately went, uh, which was Brainshark. So do me a favor, let's just start there. Um, give give yeah. uh, my audience and me, frankly, a refresher as far as um, the, your career and how you ended up um, at your last company, which was Salsify. Yeah, so so uh, we did meet and I was uh, near the end of the line at, at, at Softrax where I grew up as a salesperson. I grew up as an individual contributor, ultimately worked my way up into middle management and running a sales team, a regional team, and then, and then um, a VP of sales on the executive team. I left there and that's where we met and I went to Brainshark. And interestingly enough, when I made that transition, it was during the, the downturn that we had in 2008, 2009, our, our, our recession, uh, financial recession. And um, Brainshark was great. It was a wonderful four years. We grew that business significantly over that year period of time. And I learned a lot and I learned a lot and grew as a, as a sales leader. Um, I left there and, and after four years and went to a company called Time Trade, where we provided uh, customer experience management software. Essentially, what we did is we provided the Apple Store experience for all of the retailers and financial services that were not Apple. So think about virtual queuing and appointment setting and aligning resources to deliver. Um, and then most recently, I, I left Time Trade. Most recently, went to a company called Salsify, where I've been for for five years, uh, and at the beginning of this year, I, I transitioned out of Salsify. A great five years where we grew the business from 30 customers to over 750 customers and to 450 employees, and really a, 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 a high-performing growth company uh, focused on providing software to brands and uh, supporting brands, uh, e-commerce, and this. Uh, so, you know, that's been my career. Um, here and all based in Boston. Yeah, and one of the things that you and I talked about the other day that, you know, has always just amazed me is that, you know, I talk to so many individual contributors, I talk to so many sales leaders, and everybody seems to have a, um, a hiccup or continually challenged in terms of really getting traction somewhere and, and improving the sales organization to the scale that you know they envisioned, that their company envisioned, and it seems to me like again going all the way back to soft tracks and, and the way that um, I think even at Brain Shark you started off as a, a direct at a director level, moved yourself up into VP level, um, and then just what you've done, um, you know, at, at most recently at Salsify, um, is, is is quite remarkable. Um, and so that's why I wanted to have you on and talk to you and sort of get into your head, if you can, where you know, I don't always get an opportunity to do that. I know the people that are listening don't get an opportunity to to hear the, how the John DeVagians of the world think. But one of the things I want to follow up on is you mentioned that you got to Brainshark around 2008-ish when, you know, that was when Lehman Brothers collapsed in that fall of 2008 and, and things were just sort of um, going crazy. I don't want to spend too much time on, on this whole thing about the pandemic, but I, I think it's informative um, for people to hear um, what were things like 
uh, there and uh, back in 2008? And what can you, what do you remember or what hurdles did you overcome and achieve then that maybe people could think about now um, as they go through what we're going through now in terms of, um, you know, the challenges and uncertainty? Well, you know, I, I'm fortunate enough or old enough to, to have also gone through 2001, 2002, and 2003 mm -hmm. with the dot-com bust. So um, learnings from that, that period helped me through 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. And um, you'll get through it. It'll come, the economy will come back. The economy is an amazing thing. And depending on the industry that's impacted most, it's different. It's different for, for the different solutions that you're providing. The one thing that I, that I can tell you is that, um, you know, people will tell you to work harder or work longer. That's not necessarily it. In these, in these times, you need to work smarter. You need to align with your prospects you need to, and customers. You need to support them in a way that maybe you didn't have to a year ago. And that support comes in, what can you offer them? What help can you offer them? What, what can you do to support their business and initiatives that they have without actually selling them something? Because if you're able to build better relationships through this environment, as soon as it turns, and it's gonna turn quick, I think, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's gonna turn quick, then um, all of these projects and all this pent up demand, you're gonna be the chosen vendor and you'll be able to capitalize on it. And that's true for individual sales reps, for managers, for people in customer success roles. I think it's, it's critical that you embrace your customers and prospects at this time. Yeah, and I've heard that from a couple of people as well, which is, and that's what I'm trying to do, frankly, in my business as well, which is to service the heck out of the customers that I have and, and, and over deliver. Um, so that to your point, when the, when, yeah. when the pent up demand um, goes from being pent up to actual, <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that you'll, that you'll have that, you'll, that you'll reap that benefit. Um, so let's, let me get into the, your the way of thinking, I guess, if you will. Uh, and so let's say for instance um you know you're 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 evaluated an organization um you're actually there on the job you're like first day on the job maybe you're a cro maybe you're, maybe the ceo um you know how much time does it take to assess the the sales culture of an organization um what do you need to know about the sales culture of an organization to really start putting in and making the changes or doing whatever you need to do in order to get it to whatever it is that, that you want it to be and wherever they want it to be? That's a good question. And there's a lot in there, Jay. So let me, let me unpack that a little bit. So, so it's hard to put a timeline on it right away, hmm. but let me, let, me, let me answer the, what do you look for and how do you actually understand what the culture is? Hmm. And I think we all agree that in, in, in a sales organization, performance matters. But underneath performance, you need to make sure there's a winning attitude and people feel like they can win. Do people have grit? Can they, can they get problems solved? Can they close deals? Do they have that, that grit, that grind to figure it out, especially at a startup, knowing that each month, each day, each week is gonna be different. And do they have the underlying confidence as a team, as individuals, um, not only in themselves, but in the company, in the solution, in the mission um, that they're trying to, to accomplish. If you have those things and you're looking at it as a startup, a relatively small business, then I think you've got the underpinnings for a strong team. Now, does it take a month or does it take a quarter to really understand where the gaps are, to understanding where the next level of support is? For example, what tools do I need to, to then implement? What training needs to be implemented? What processes need to be changed? What metrics and measurements uh, do you need? All of that can be, can be understood through listening and understanding, but some of those core competencies are, are critical. How do you, when you talk about confidence and or the winning attitude, if it's not there, how do you inject it, if you will, right? If you sense it, how do you, what do you, how do you go about actually injecting it or changing that culture? Yeah, it's, how, how do you define small wins, right, Jay? If, if you look at it, as in a win is only a closed deal. If it takes 180 days or six months to close a deal, there's no short-term wins. And it can be really hard and tiring for, for a business that's trying to scale. Mm -hmm. So what wins can, can be within the week? And those wins that you define for people could be number of new, new meetings that they get, number of new contacts that they, met, that they made. It could be a webinar that they hosted that got a certain number of attendees create short-term wins 
that are aligned with that, that longer term um, goal of, of whether it's revenue or customer or whatever the attainment metric is. Got it. And, and celebrate them and you got to celebrate them. Are you, in those early days, are you, how much are you relying on um, the data that's in front of you there as, as you come in, right? There's the, there's the intangible, which is the winning attitude, the grit, the confidence and those types of things. And then there's the data because you talk about sort of those short term wins. If you know that a sales cycle is 180 days and you know that there are certain things that need to happen within that sales, um, that sales process. And obviously there are certain milestones that need to be hit along the way. Um, how much are you relying on the information um, that you're given when you first come in or, is that, or does that come later? I think most sales organizations say they're, they're metric focused, but they aren't. Mm. Um, and they've got too many metrics and they don't know actually how to use them as a, as a guiding principle. So I don't necessarily trust those metrics. Um, in sales, there's only three things that you can actually do. You can close more deals. You can close them, you can close them faster in a shorter period of time. And you can close them for more money. Now, there's about 100 things that you can do to impact those three, three pivots. Um, when you look at the sales cycle, for example, if you walk into a company, it's 180 days. Well, there might be a way to do a sales cycle for 90 days, whether it's a different price point, a different message, a different packaging of the product, presenting it a little bit differently, adjusting your process, incorporating other uh, folks into your process. So analyzing those things is really important within the first 30 days. So which of those three metrics can I impact the most? And am I going to get the biggest bang in the shortest period of time? Because over, you know, over a year or over five years, you're going to have to impact any one of those three, right? Those are, those are kind of the, the, the guiding lights and then anything else that you can do to support those. How do you know which one of those two that you can impact the most during that period of time? What are you looking at? How do you, how do you yeah. assess, go about looking at that and assessing that? I think you have to, you have to interview the existing team. Okay. You have to in, in, interview the existing reps and understand what are their obstacles and what's slowing them down. You have to talk to customers. Why did they buy and why are they using your solution? Why didn't they buy? And you have to sit on a few prospect calls and you need to then understand where's, you know, are we not charging enough? Are we not charging enough for our solution? When I first started at, at Salsify, it was clear we weren't charging enough. You know, I remember that the team was saying, Nobody ever asked for a discount. They want to buy right away. And then you sit there and you're like, well, maybe we should increase the price a little bit. Um, also, you know, in, in previous companies, the sales cycle was elongated out. And when you talk to prospects and customers, they say they, they wish they could get started sooner, but our process, meaning our company's process, made them do X, Y, and Z, or fill out X, Y, and Z before signing a contract, which it lengthened the process by another two or three weeks. And so how could I adjust that process to shorten the sales cycle? Right. And then closing more logos or closing more new deals is just a function of how do I set goals that people can achieve and strive for, you know, let's not be happy with one. If we can get two. You mentioned that it's interesting, right? You talk about that. They said that customers weren't asking for discounts. They would just, they would just buy. And you said, well, maybe we'll, maybe we should increase the price. My, my, I guess the first thought I have is, is there a win percentage that you're looking at to say, okay, like this is where it, like in other words, if we're winning 100% of our deals, right? Then it's like, okay, we should, we can raise the prices, right? Yeah. We should raise the prices because obviously we can be charging more. Is there, where's, where's the line, I guess, if you will, and to say like, you know, we've, we've raised our prices and we don't need to, we're not going to raise them again, or we've raised our prices in the numbers. We're looking at the fact that now we're not winning every deal, but that's okay because we're, we're not expecting to win every deal. Like, how do you think about, how do you think through all that? Well, I'll also say that your customer success is so much bandwidth, right, in the moment. So you oh. need to scale um, efficiently. But to answer your question is if, if I'm increasing the price, I need to watch the other two metrics really closely. And embedded within those metrics are a whole host of other metrics. Mm. But at, at the level we're talking at, Jay, is if, if I increase the price and my sales cycle it, it, uh, gets longer, then I've got a problem. If I increase the price and I close less, then I've got a problem. If I increase the price and I'm able to freeze 
the conversion rate in terms of the volume that I closed and freeze the length of and I'm going to make more money. I can't, I, I have to make more money. Much like if I leave the price the same and I'm able to increase the volume, either through BDRs or marketing, increase top of funnel, and then convert more through by refining the sales process, then I'm going to make more money. If I'm able to close things faster, keeping the sales price and the conversion rates the same, then it's going to give me more selling capacity and therefore more productivity and thus I'll grow the business. Got it. And how do you go about imp implementing these changes, right? In other words, if you have a sales team and sales management that used to selling at a certain price point, how much pushback or reluctance do you get? Uh, so the head trash, right? You talk about a winning attitude. How do you go about implementing these changes and what are the conversations like with your management team, with their reps, um, frankly, with, with uh, other leaders of the, of the organization, the executive team? Tell me about what that looks like. You know, Jay, uh, change is tough. Change is really tough. And you hear it. You're in recruiting. You hear it from sales leaders and sales reps all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, they tell you that, I, the, you know, I couldn't adapt. I didn't adapt. That person didn't adapt. We were doing things differently. We changed our process. And it's true. Um, and I think that's the one, that's the number one failure that, that reps and man leaders have is they're afraid of change. They're afraid of, like, is the change going to be right? Am I going to break something? What's going to go wrong? Will it fail? Is it the right change to make? And there is no right or wrong, right? You're making changes to actually scale the business and grow it faster. And uh, it has to happen. It has to happen. It has to happen a lot. So whether you make changes every six months, every month, every year, you know, the, 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 the scale that you operate at or require it. And the details are in how do I do territories? How do I do quotas? How do I set messaging and targets? You know, what do I want my team and how do I want them to operate? What's their operating cadence? And if I'm measuring all of that and I'm making changes and ultimately people are part of this too, then the business is going to grow. You know, the, the territory quota and messaging that you had when you were 10 million is a lot different than when you're 50 million. And so when you're, when you're looking at all that, are you, are you, is it collaborative? In other words, are you sitting down with your members of your management team and saying like, here's what I'm seeing. This is why we need to change this. This is what we, why we need to, to do this. Are you, are you sitting down obviously with, you know, let's say members of the executive team and saying, you know, here's what I'm finding. Is that, is that logistically or functionally how it's actually working? That's, that's the basis of, of doing this hundred percent J. So you need to sit down with, with your leaders in the, in this case, in the sales organization, and set it up so that over the next 12 to 18 months, this is the performance that we're looking for. And this is what we want the team to look like or the organization to look like. And this is how we want to operate with our customers and our prospects. Do we have the team today? Where are we missing? Where are we gapped? What changes do we need to make across a, a whole bunch of areas? Mm -hmm. and, then, and then as you start defining those, you've got, the, you've got the details of it. Now, at the executive team level, you know, we set our goals every year. And as a sales leader, your job is to go out and hit that goal, hit that number, right? And they expect that you're going to change your partners on the exec team expect that you're going to make, you know, changes year to year because each year is different. Um, and and uh, so they're looking for you to bring that leadership back to the table and, 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 and also let them know the support that you need from them. How much does... Um how much does the the existing team sales team play a role in that and i guess what i mean is is that is there a an expectation based on your own experience um that says you know part of it's probably personnel and i'm probably going to have to upgrade at a couple of positions um because to your point earlier uh, people because change is 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 really hard and i i'm going to assume baked into my thought process here that some people are just not going to get on board and then I'm going to have to um, cut them and upgrade. I think the the number one thing is you need to communicate and collaborate with the team. Mm -hmm. And usually people realize it, that they're not comfortable doing things differently. They don't want to change. Doing today is work. Why would I change my process? Why would I change my territory? 
and is that the company is changing not not to make you on but to actually support the growth of the business or to grow it faster and so it leads to having some of those conversations, Jay, where, hey, it's time to. I mean, that hap happens to all of us. At some point, you need to realize, you know, that it's time to. Right. Guys, sorry, I'm, I'm, I stopped the recording and we're going to come back in now. Uh, sorry, the, it, it paused there for a second. So you might not have heard everything that, that John was saying, but um, we're talking about the, the team and making the change of uh, looking at the talent and, and what the impact on that is. So just pick up where, where, where we left off, if you will. Yeah, I think change is tough. I think change is tough and, and communication and collaboration is key. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, Jay, yeah, people need to change to move the organization forward. Intuitively, as humans, we're, we don't want to change. Right. Is there a, you know, we talked about in the beginning in terms of, okay, there's, you come in, you assess the sales culture of the organization, want make sure that people have the right mindset going forward. And that time is always a challenge, right? Because you never know how long this is going to take before you get all the information. But I wonder... Um, with all of your the breadth of your experience, do you operate on, out of some sort of a, a framework or a playbook, if you will, that says, okay, like, here's what's worked for me in the past, not necessarily, um, you know, line by line, but just holistically, like, this is what I typically come in and do. Is that something that um, one of the reasons why you've been able to duplicate success over and over again, it's kind of like a sales process, right? People that are process oriented tend to have, you know, to sustain success because of that process. So I'm wondering what your style is like when you're coming into a new organization. Um, I am very process oriented and, and I do follow um, a lot of different metrics. Um, when I do jump in every, every place is different. Every company is different. Every company has unique, um, unique opportunities. Right. So I don't think there's a hard playbook that you go and implement. I think the number one thing as a new leader is you go and you need to listen and I understand what's going on. And I'll give you a couple of examples, Jay, is if you've got 10 salespeople and they're all doing things 10 different ways, then you know, you've got a process problem, right? Because there's no way to understand whose process is the best or where you're optimizing. So then you need to dive into, to, to process and pick the, the, the best points in the best ways to collaborate with the team understand what's working well, what's not working well, where are we seeing success, and you need to track and trend those things. I mean, you need to do it really quickly. Um, the second is, how are they measuring their success, and how are they measuring the momentum and progression? And as you're measuring those things, whether it be top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel, you need to make sure that there's a clear standard across the board that everybody can rally around for each one of those areas of the funnel. And that'll give you some of the early wins but it'll also help you define when rep one says, I've got a pipeline opportunity and it's going to close. And rep three says, I got a pipeline opportunity and it's going to close that you're, they're actually using the same language and it's in the same stage and making it easier for you as a new hire to then analyze whether or not, you know, either one or both are going to close. So those are things that you should be able to do in the first month. Um, and then as, after you get through the first month, You've now analyzed the team in a way that if you need to bring in some, some talent, if you need to hire a different profile rep or a manager, you can start thinking through and executing on that. Got it. That makes sense. And if you're, and, and I, often these, these conversations are centered around the individual contributors, the, the reps in terms of how managers lead them. But I know that obviously in, in most of your roles now, you've been leading other leaders, if you will, you've been managing other managers. Um, and I think it's good for them to hear um, how you go about assessing these things. So as they move up and through their careers, or if they're starting their own, uh, you know, a new opportunity um, that they can learn from this as well. But I wonder as you're assessing and let's say, for instance, a management change that needs to happen and you need somebody, a good, strong sales director, let's just say, or a VP of sales. Um, if you could complete the sentence for me, a leader's ability to drive results is directly related to his ability to do what? What would you say the, that what is? A leader's ability to drive results is directly related to his or her ability to... Um, 
uh, you drive accountability is the most important piece of this. Okay. It, a leader, and, and this is uh, whether you're a leader of, of managers or a leader of reps, mm -hmm. I think it's really important that um, you set clear responsibilities and process so that you can monitor, communicate progress, and measure their results. And if you can do those things, people want to win. People want to, you know, you're in sales for conversations. We're a little bit extroverted. We want to meet with people. We want to solve problems. We want to do all of these things. Yep. And it's funny. I was talking, I, you and I talked about this the other day. Matter of fact, I texted him. I was texting with the guy that we were talking about um, the other day that, that used to work for you. Remember the name, the name of the guy that, that worked at, uh, with you at Time Trade and Salsify? Remember I was telling you yes, about him? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, Mike, I, yeah. I, yeah I, I was texting him uh, yesterday, actually. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I'm going to be interviewing John. I'm like, what should I, you know, what should I ask him about? Like, what do you, you know, <laughs> what do you say? And he did bring up um, metrics as, as being one, but then also um, just sort of, um, you know, that you are process driven in, the, in those types of things, right? Um, but one of the things that he did tell me offline when I said, when actually, when I met with him in person is... Um, you know, that, you know, he, he said to me, he said, you know, I'm like, John, like, why are you, you know, he was like, he said to you one time, like, why do you ride me so hard? Like, what, what's going on? And he said, because it's my job. And what he told me uh, is that, like, he, speaking of reps want to win, he said that under your leadership um, at two companies, uh, he said that he performed at his highest level and performed better than he had um, throughout any point in his career uh, because of what you just said, right? Because you innately know um, that people want to be pushed. Kind of like, I don't want to, you know, necessarily trivialize it, but I feel the same way now that I'm a dad and I geek out over everything being dad, um, that my kids almost crave the discipline. They crave the follow through. They crave, you know, the fact that, you know, what you mean, you say what you mean, right? Even though they might sort of push back at the end of the day, I think they're better for it. And, and I think, um, you know, with, 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 as a sales leader in, in driving your team to, to results, like you said, in accountability, people want to be held accountable um, because that's how they get the best out of themselves. And I think as a, as a leader and as a manager, um, that's what you're talking about here and what you've been able to do. And, and it's great to hear that. Jay, um, certainly from, from some of the reps that, that uh, I've had the opportunity to work with. And I've worked with a number of fantastic uh, reps, managers, and people over the years. Um, I'll say the number one skill that uh, to be a manager or to move up to be a VP, and, and, and a lot of your audience is probably looking to do that, is their ability to coach people. And your ability to coach people is not dictating to them or telling them what to do or slamming your fist on the table, it truly is coaching. And I think that um, many folks don't really understand what coaching is. And, and coaching is, is not giving the answer, but asking a lot of questions. Is uh, how, can I, how can a rep that's got a, uh, an opportunity, how can I ask questions so they can devise the right account plan, so they can devise the right presentation, so they can devise how to get over the, the objections they've got. If I give them the answer every time, then they're just going to go execute and they're going to come back and say, I did what you told me and it didn't work. You know, our job is to grow and to facilitate this within our reps and, and to coach our reps and our managers too, for that matter. And so that they can operate and develop on their own. And um, so, you know, the, 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 the rep that you spoke to, Mike, that you spoke to, I would say that the ability to coach somebody that, that way is important, but also people have to be receptive to coaching. And if they're receptive to coaching, then they're going to do exceptional things. Sales is really hard. Sales is really hard. You need a coach. And you, you need to realize that, what, eight or nine out of ten times, you're going to, you're going to lose or you're not going to get a call back. So, you, you know, it's hard. It can, it can really drain on you. You can go a few days without a good call. And then when you have that good call, you still have to bring your A game. So you have to bring it. You don't know which one of those is going to be – is going to be the great call or the great opportunity for you. And that's where, that's where coaches make their biggest impact. How do you coach coaching? And what I mean by that is that I feel like we always talk about coaching sales reps and coaching them on 
the call or coaching them on their pitch or coaching them on the product or, you know, all those things, right? When you talk about coaching coaches and, you, you know, you talk about, um, you know, a great coach will ask the right questions and those types of things and almost um, let the person that they're coaching um, discover the answer on their own so that they have some sort of ownership, right? That, like, that's, that's one part of it. But how when you're, let's say, developing your own sales leaders internally and grooming them right for their next big opportunity what does that look like what do you what are you doing um functionally i guess if you will what should other people be doing i guess well i, I mean as the leader you need to you need to set the tone they're gonna they're gonna follow what you do mm -hmm. for example um if i tell your if i tell my direct leaders what to do they'll tell their reps what to do mm -hmm. if my if i ask my direct leaders questions for example, how are we going to get over that objection? Or what do you think we can do about this? Or what do you think we can do about that? Or we've got a competitor, you know, let's, let's, you know, I, I may have part of the answer, but I don't have the complete answer. So how do I ask a lot of questions? And then how do I flip it around at the end and say, that's great. We've got a plan. When can you execute it? When are you going to have it done? When are you, you know, when are we going to see the impact of that? And that's where you flip from coaching to driving accountability, right? and they take ownership of it. Now, they'll use those same tactics on their reps. And you know, it's a different level, it's a different level of inspection within the pipeline, but they, they, you need to model it for them. We sit in rooms and we talk about coaching, like you just said, on presentations, on calls. No, you're, you're training and you're telling them. You're not coaching, right. right? It's like, let's do a role play. We role play and I tell you the role play stinks. I tell you the role play stinks, then you get all upset, right? That's not coaching, right? We do the role play and I tell you the role play is great, except for this, 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 and this, then like, that, that's not helpful either. What you want is let's do the role play and then let me ask you questions. Jay, how do you think that went? Where do you think, where do you think you struggled? Let's play it back. You know, if we recorded it, let's play it back and let's look at it and let's analyze it together. That's coaching, right? Because they're going to sell, they'll be able to make those adjustments. Um, and then it's the same thing at the manager level. It's, it's, a, it's, it's tough. It can be really tough because you got the pressure of making the number. Right. And so speaking of that, making the number, so many questions off of that, but we could go forever. But I, maybe we'll do a part two here. But um, uh, Happy to do it because <laughs> coaching is coaching. You brought up kids, Jay, yeah. right? Yeah. And you coach your kids. Yes. I mean, I've got, and part of the reason we're having bandwidth issues is I've got a high schooler and a middle schooler that are doing virtual school this time of year. So they're, 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 they're using, I mean, my wife's a teacher, so I've got bandwidth out, out, the, out the Yazoo going on here. But um, we coach our kids, whether it's at sports, school, their, uh, their relationships with their friends, we coach them. We don't tell them what to do. Well, maybe sometimes we do, but, you know. <laughs> You know, you That's know, right. we clean their room. But That's in other right. ways, we're we're coaching them. Right, right. And so, when when a when a sales leader, let's say for instance, somebody yeah. um, that you know, he's a director of sales, sales manager, has a group of that uh, that he or she is managing, mm -hmm. when they miss their forecast, um, are there commonalities? And and I guess is, and I'll ask it, I guess, in a way where from what you just said. Do they miss their forecast um, be a, a lot of ways because they haven't necessarily coached the right behaviors in the teams over a period of time? Is that as systemic as it can be? Or what are the, some of the reasons why a sales leader will miss his or her forecast? Uh, I think the number one reason is they're not consistently inspecting the opportunities with mm -hmm. the same lens across their team. And we could go into a, a, that's like coaching, your ability to inspect, you need to have a process as a manager that you're gonna, that you're gonna use to inspect the opportunities. And it needs to be the same for each of your reps. Remember earlier I said, if you have 10 reps and there were 10 different sales processes, you're never gonna be able to forecast accurately because you're not gonna be able to inspect it the same. The other piece of this is a lot of times sales reps wanna tell stories about what happened on calls and meetings. And sales managers get into the storytelling and they talk about what to do next. They're not necessarily inspecting underpinnings of the deal. Do you have an executive sponsor? Is there a need? Why did they make a change? Why would they pick you? Why would they do it now? Like, uh, and then where are they in the process? 
Have they asked for references? Do you have a quote in front of them? Have you, have you done a project or proposal or statement of work, depending on the line of business that you're in? You know, there are certain uh, milestones that need to be achieved, as well as, you know, the certain whys. And if number one, and it's by far, is the lack of inspection or consistent inspection. Let me ask you the why then behind that. Why do you think that is? In other words, why aren't they inspecting more of the opportunities? Oh, well, I, I think it's hard. I think it's hard. And I think, I think that for the most part, they don't know what they should be inspecting. Hmm. They haven't been trained. They haven't been taught, you know, um, and they haven't been mentored. It sounds they to need me a like... playbook to be able to go. And, and, and this is where, like back in the day when I got into sales, it was all about BANT, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and then medic is super popular now. There's a number of these um, different approaches to qualifying a deal. You need to pick one. Sandler's got one. Everybody's got, every trainer's got one, right? But you need to pick one and then you need to implement that. How you can actually qualify a deal. I'm a big fan of medic. But um, because I think medic is a great guidepost for sales reps and sales managers to understand where you are in the deal and why people will buy. Um, but, you know, if you don't have that, then that, and you're not and you're not consistently measuring it against that, then you're going to you're going to forecast based on your gut. You're going to sit here and you're going to say um, this rep, rep one always makes their number. So I'm going to put them down for making their number. Rep two always misses their number, so I'm going to put them down for missing their number and then hand in your forecast. And it's like, if rep one doesn't crush it, then you're going to miss your, you're going to miss the number, you know, with that mentality. It sounds to me like what the, you know, the questions that you're asking in terms of how a, how a, um, a manager should be inspecting the deals, those questions sound a lot like a, the questions that, a, which is why you were asking them, of course, what, the questions that a rep would ask the prospect or their champion or whomever it is on the other side of the phone or in, in, in the meeting, right? In other words, that's the process that the rep should be going through and the questions that should be asking. So I guess when you say that it's hard, right? In other words, it's hard to inspect those opportunities. Why though? I don't understand because they were doing it as individual contributors. They were doing it as reps presumably right or not but let's just presume that they were why do they stop doing it from a management perspective and in other words i guess what i'm asking is it's it, different jay it's okay. it's a lot different right if i'm working on a deal and you're my prospect mm -hmm. right we're gonna have conversations and we're gonna have dialogue and i'm gonna i'm gonna have all of these thoughts you know about why you're gonna change what's the What's, what's the decision that you're going to make and what's the process and who needs to be involved and exec sponsor, all of the stuff, right? And I'm going to write them all, all my notes down. Then I'm going to go meet with my manager and my manager is going to identify where the gaps are by inspecting my pipeline. Fast forward, now I become a manager. When I become a manager, now I need to do that for my reps. But I haven't been taught how to do it to a rep. I only, I know how to do it with a, with a, with a, with a prospect. So let's go back to coaching for a moment. Mm -hmm. Those managers, especially when you first move into management, you're now telling your rep what to do versus inspecting their pipeline. You're telling your rep, go get the executive sponsor, go figure out what the process is, go ask these questions or get me on the call with you and I'll figure out what, you know, to fill in where we're gapped instead of coaching them and inspecting the deals and the opportunities. And that's where the gap is. When people move from, from um, individual contributor to manager, they don't understand that that dynamic needs to change in the way that you do that inspection. Because you're not doing that inspection on your deals the way I'm. Got it. Yep, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. So let me ask you this. I have just a couple of other questions. Um, if, as you, obviously, like you said in the beginning, right, you, you left Salsify um, after five years and bringing them from, I think you said, was it 30 customers to over 700 customers um, and just completely built, built that sales team to the way that you did. I know that you're um, open now to other opportunities. As you go about evaluating the next thing for John Davigian, um, 
how do you go about evaluating that and, and what would you be looking for in, in the next opportunity? So, uh, you know, I, I enjoy scaling businesses. I, scale, I enjoy scaling businesses that are, you know, in the, maybe they're about 20, 25 million and how do you scale them up? Salsify was a lot smaller um, and we scaled them and it's, it's uh, I mean, about 400, 450 people now and, and growing. And that's what I enjoy doing. So part of this is finding, you know, a company that I can scale that's in a space that is one where I, where I enjoy. And I enjoy selling business applications to business people. Um, and that's, that's, I've primarily done that. Um, the other piece of this is in the current environment with this shutdown around the coronavirus is I think there's a lot of technologies that are going to be born through this period of time. So when we get to the other side of this, the way we work and the way that we become more efficient, and that would be whether you're selling to brands or you're selling to manufacturers, you're selling to restaurants, whoever it might be, there's a huge opportunity here. And I'm looking for those solutions that, that uh, you know, who knows, that, that are going to be the next rocket ship. Well, I hope they're listening to this podcast because um, this rocket ship called John DeVagin is going to be taking off, <laughs> going <laughs> to take off and land someplace else before they, before they know it. So uh, if you're listening, uh, definitely you want to reach out to this man to at least say thank you, seek his advice, or perhaps maybe talk to him about an opportunity that you have. Uh, and that's a good point, Jay. I, I, I am doing um, consulting and some advising right now. So I'm doing that for a bunch of young entrepreneurs here in the Boston area, primarily and one in New York that, um, you know, it's great. It's great to help these folks. And there's some great technology that's going to be coming to market here relatively soon um, and make a big impact. So how can these folks uh, reach out to you and, and, and get in touch with you um, and engage in for any number of different reasons? Well, LinkedIn, LinkedIn is the easiest way. So you can send me a LinkedIn message. Feel free to do that. Um, or email me. Um, my email is on my LinkedIn profile, but it's the letter J and then my last name, D-A-V-A-G-I-A-N, number three, uh, at gmail.com. John DeVagin, you just went over quota. Thanks, Jay. This was great. Hope to do it again. Absolutely. Thank you, my friend. Goodbye, everybody.